so you're going to be meeting with Netflix and Shondaland tomorrow. And I was like, oh, okay. Recognizing what the end goal is really is important. Otherwise, you might just be in a constant state of misery and chasing. There is nothing to be gained from trying to fit in and trying to assimilate. I recognize that I look different. I didn't understand what it meant. And actually, the things that make me different are the most beautiful things about me. And they're my greatest strengths. Bridgerton is a beautiful fantasy. It's not historically accurate. Otherwise, everyone would have no teeth and gout. <laughs> Do you really think men look like Colin Firth? No, they were disgusting. Do you think women were hairless? No, they were hairy. Bridgerton shows how beautiful the world could be. How exciting to imagine a world that is like this with a black queen. Isn't that beautiful? Whether that dream thought you have is a trickle or a steady flowing stream. Despite any seeming obstacles, don't ever doubt your dreams. You've made this transition from the world of consulting. You're now a professional actress. I was the most successful I'd ever been, recognizable I'd ever been, and yet I felt like a complete. Greetings, I'm Ashley Samuels McKenzie. And I'm Charles Parkinson. And welcome to How I Became. Where we unveil the unscripted journeys of inspirational figures. Hi there, I'm Charitra Chandran, and this is how I became an actor, advocate, and the season's diamond. If you enjoy the show, could you do one thing? Subscribe. Wherever you are, just click the subscribe or follow button. That simple act can help us grow the podcast in a big way, and we need your support to do it. And if you really want to help play a part in our growth, Rate us on Spotify or leave a review on Apple Podcasts. It would mean the world. Thank you. Born in Scotland to two parent doctors, this guest's path has taken a few twists and turns. Finding a budding love for drama at boarding school, despite being told it wasn't for her and she should focus on a different subject to hone and learn. Taking the leap forwards towards her future, she signed up to an agent. To then learning more about the industry, going through challenges that exist and create barriers, prejudices that are not always blatant. A shock call out of the blue set her on the path to Netflix-driven stardom, a reflection on how following passions is real and not pie-in-the-sky wishes or jargon. Introducing Charithra Chandran. I'm sure this episode will leave us all enlightened. So as our first episode of season four, perhaps this episode shall be the season's diamond. Thank you. Welcome. Can I get that copy? Oh, of course. I'd like to frame it and put it up. <laughs> I've never had, I've had one poem written for me before. Yeah? From a friend, but this is the second. Oh, amazing. It's very lovely, thank you. You're very welcome. <laughs> and you are, uh, uh, you were previously a listener of the show. You've heard an mm. episode, now you're a guest. Yes. What, when did you first come across How It Came? Uh, so I came across How I Became, actually, sort of in part the reason that we met, which was... Um, I knew I, I was invited to the Wackle dinner mm -hmm. and I knew that Nishma was sort of running Wackle at the time and I was one of, gonna be one of her guests. Um, and one of my best friends also works in advertising and you know, Nishma's such a role model to her and said to me, you have to listen to this podcast. It's amazing. It is so insightful and very vulnerable. And I guess, Often when women are presented in a vulnerable light, you can come across looking, I guess maybe a little bit like a damsel in distress, whereas Nishma came across looking so strong and so powerful and in control of her life. I just loved the way that you guys let her tell her story and her story is, was incredible. So yeah. Oh, that's lovely. I hadn't heard that. That's mm. very nice to hear. So thank <laughs> you. And I loved the moment that we spoke and I said, uh, from how it became, you, I don't know if you remember this, but you pointed to your friend, you shouted to your friend and you pointed at me and you went, how I became, how I became. <laughs> oh my God, that's so rude. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. the first time I've been referred to as how I became, not Charles. Um, <laughs> the brand, so, not the man. so rude, I'm sorry. I just know how much she loves the show and so. Okay. It's fine, I loved it, it's fine. very yeah. funny. Shout out Nishma every time. Yes. Doing great work for women and for the industry. She really, really is, she's phenomenal. Yeah, so you, actually if you're watching this and you haven't seen that episode, you can go and search Nishma Rob 
and find out her story um, of rising up to the top ranks of Google. And now she's on to a new chapter, which we mm, don't know what that know. is yet. Yeah. So, yeah. And if I recall, she has the longest episode on our on our um, channel so far, yeah. like two and a half um, hours. I a think. great story. Yeah. Um, and then also shout out Wackle. So Wackle is women Always. in leadership in advertising mm -hmm. going for 100 years. Mm -hmm. Amazing story in itself. Um, Absolutely. OK, now on to. Oh, actually, I just want to say for anybody watching this, this is our new home and you're the yes. first guest in our new home at yep. Spotify it's Studios. Fancy, Spotify yes. Studios. Yeah, yeah, what do you think of the place? It's lovely, it's huge. And you didn't do video before, right? This we is did new. do video. You could have watched I didn't see this the video. Most. You could have I watched the whole thing. See, I listened to it on Spotify and it's I don't think I saw the video. You, yeah, yeah. You just needed to unlock your phone that it was. There we go, There guys. you go. And go. I thought I, I thought it was going to be two firsts, first video and first at Spotify <laughs> Studios. Well, it's still special. It's very special. Super special. It's super fancy. It's Look very at, nice. Oh, no, no. I'm well, they, they're not, but they might they want to be. Me... Show them. Who's, <laughs> right. What have you got there? <laughs> I, I got offered so many drinks, guys. A variety. <laughs> Spoilt. <laughs> <laughs> now to your story. Mm -hmm. This is the story of a, a young lady who has dreams. Oh mm. God. She has dreams to be an actress one day. Mm. Up against all the odds. All the it's odds. very small percentage that make it. Mm. Um, very small percentage with a heritage of South Asian, mm -hmm. let alone just any actress mm. in, in, in the UK. Um, but you had this dream and you almost gave up on it. Yeah. But something happened and you turned it all around. And mm. suddenly you became a Netflix superstar, oh, an God. Amazon Prime superstar. Oh, God. When you, so you were in Bridgerton, for anybody who doesn't know. Mm -hmm. And at the time, when it came out in, um, in 20, uh, 2020? So 2020. the first season came out 2020, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And your season came out? 2022. 2022. When it came out, it was, after the first month, it was the most watched Netflix show of all time yeah. in the UK, of, of UK English time. speaking. Um, yeah. So you shot to fame and it, it almost second, didn't happen. So I wasn't in the first season, I was yeah, only in the second. second. But yeah, it was a major, a major life change, I guess, for many reasons. We, we will get there, yeah. we won't jump into it yet. But um, to say that this is a story for anybody who's got a dream, it might mm. be a career dream that they want, a business. They just want to ch turn their life around. They want to follow that passion that they've always had. Mm -hmm. Yours is a, is a story of people can learn from of, of your tact because you, you actually made it happen is my perspective. You will be very humble and say you didn't, but there were mm -hmm. things that you did take action yeah. and you did play a part in, in that happening. And, yeah. and we're going to really delve down into the, the specifics of that so people can learn how you turn things around so they can turn things around for themselves. And also, not only that, but when you get your dream, what to do after that? Because if you look at Olympians, when they get that medal afterwards, it's very well known that they go into depression. Yeah. So there's that whole other side of it. If you then go and get your dream of what to do after and how to deal with the challenges of that, which you've had to do as well. I'm not Absolutely. saying it was depression, but go through the challenges of getting your dream as well. So that is what's to come. But let's go back to Perth. Yes. Not Perth, Australia. Perth, Scotland. That's where it all began, right? Right. I feel really bad because, I mean, I'm flattered, but I also feel bad because I, I was born in Scotland, I promise, but um, I don't really remember it, right? And I haven't actually been back since I was two years old. Really? But um, yeah, but because of my birthplace, I see like on a lot of websites, people say I'm a Scottish actress, oh, really? which all my friends find very funny. <laughs> I find it very flattering. I love the Scottish, so. So to summarize, um, well, you're two years old and let's just dive straight into something mm. that happens when you're two years old. Um, your parents. Yeah, they separate, yeah. They separate. Um, obviously, I assume you don't remember that. No. Um, but. Tell us a bit, and, and, and your parents play a key sort of role in your whole life. I'm going to delve into that as well, but mm. um, tell us a bit about your parents to start off with. Yeah. Well, I think um, my parents are really the loves of my lives. I think that 
they I they are the most important people in my life. They are the most influential. They will always be equal number ones in my life. And I think that, you know, that relationship, while the foundations were always there, it is hard earned. Like every single relationship in your life is hard work. There are ups and there are downs. But I think what I now know has always been there is just this immense love to the mm -hmm. point of, I'd say, obsession, right? Like I'd say my parents are obsessed with me. They think about me all the time and I'm obsessed with them. And that can that is amazing and what a privilege, but it can also be bad at times. It's not always good, especially when you're an only child, right? Mm. Well, and I th and, and their, their role plays a, a big part in your decision to, to do this, but we will yeah. get to that. I want to learn a bit about them though. Them. So in terms of they're a, a, a Tamil Indian. They are Tamil Indian family. Yeah. So um, my parents were bo both born and brought up for the first, you know, almost 30 years of their life mm. in India. Right. Um, a very, my father was from an incredibly poor family. You know, uh, my grandparents were farmers. My grandparents, my father's parents didn't go to school. No, wow. to read and write, oh, wow. right? Um, and over the summers, while he was in medical school, one of the best medical schools in the state, he was carrying rice sacks on his back for something like one to two dollars a day, right? Because he needed the money. Mm. Um, and I think that I carry that with me. And I think that is why I'm always, you say it's humility. I think it's just self-awareness. I recognize how lucky and how privileged I am in countless, countless ways. And yes, I have worked hard to be where I am, but I also have a lot. I, I have won the birth lottery, right? I happen to be born in a wealthy country to educated parents, looking the way I look, various privileges. So, you know, and, and it's because of my father and being so close to poverty and still having a lot of family that are of very different means and circumstances to myself that I'm aware of that. I see some of my cousins and I think I am no smarter than them. I look like them. Um, and our lives are so different. Mm. And for anybody who, who doesn't know the, the differences about Tamil culture maybe versus other cultures in India or, yeah. or tell us a bit about Tamil yeah. culture so we can learn a bit. Yeah, of course. So um, Tamil people are very proud. Um, there are Tamilians in India around, God, large margin of error, but like 70 to 80 million Tamilians okay. in India. Wow. And then something like four to five million Tamilians in Sri Lanka. I've got mm. some stats here. Oh. Five point nine percent of the population in India are are in are in Tamil Nadu. Yeah. Uh, the state. Uh, Fifteen percent in Sri Lanka. Seven percent in Malaysia. Five percent in Singapore. Wow. Yeah. So we it's um yeah there's a lot of us. We're also um we also represent a lot of the Indian diaspora across the world. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm we're proud people. I'm really proud to say that a lot of prominent British South Asian, actually, and American South Asian figures are of Tamil origin. Um, yeah, it makes me really proud. We're, I think, because our language is so different, we are quite separate from the rest of India. Oh, interesting. In the same way, like our politics, the two national parties don't have any seats in Tamil Nadu. Mm -hmm. Um, when my mother was growing up, Hindi was actually not taught at schools. It was banned for a few years in the state. Mm, wow. So like, I think Tamilians, we do, we're so proud and we have such a strong Tamil identity because in some ways we do feel quite separate to the rest of India. And obviously we're proud Indians as well. Yeah. But um, I it's... think there is that affinity. And it's two. It's over two thousand years old. I read the la the language. The language. So yeah, it doesn't derive from Sanskrit. There is some evidence to suggest it's as old, if not older. Wow. Yeah. Mm. So um, a lot of history. A lot of history there. Um, I mean, I guess the stereotype of a Tamil person is that we're very studious, very industrial, mm -hmm. very hardworking, and not that fun. Which I don't know. You seem fun. I don't you know. Seem really? fun. Yeah. Fun. <laughs> <laughs> Um, 30,000 Hindu temples in Tamu as well. In, in, in Tamil Nadu, yeah. Tamil. Yeah, it is. And, you know, like my mum's um, mum, my grandmother, my maternal side, um, 
she, I will say like, while obviously Tamil Nadu is a predominantly, the population is predominantly Hindu, my memories from like, my memories from when I was very little visiting India and what my grandma tells me was that there was a lot of mingling of religions and there was a lot more, I guess, multiculturalism within Tamil Nadu. My grandma grew up in a Muslim area. All her friends, neighbors were Muslim. Um, mm. And I, I recognize that India as a whole, including Tamil Nadu, is going in a different direction, which it's not ideal. It breaks my heart. But, um, you know, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And your 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 parents, um, so they were in both in the medical profession, is that right? Yeah, so they were they both went to medical school and they both got sort of medical training. They did a, my father did a, some of his medical training in India um, and then they both immigrated to the UK and joined the NHS and they've been in the NHS ever since. And do you want to share what, what happened? So you're two years old and they divorced. Yeah. What, what happened? Yeah, you know, I think um, my parents had an arranged marriage, which mm. is not a forced marriage. No mm. one's being forced to do anything. Mm. It's simply like a matchmaker, you know, with family networks and sometimes even at the temple. Similar to what might happen in Bridgerton. Yes, that, it's absolutely. It's kind of like arranging. Yeah, mm, actually, yeah. totally it is. Right. And there is still a lot of autonomy there. You know, you get to meet the person, not... Now it's properly like dating, uh, yeah. supervised dating. But back then you might meet the person once or twice, you'll see a picture of them, you'll find out about their family. Um, and it's totally your choice. You know, you say no and then they suggest someone else. Mm. So they had an arranged marriage. So they didn't know each other super well. But I guess the trend back then and even now was that, you know, doctors wanted to marry doctors. Okay. Yeah. And especially because my father at that time had already like immigrated to the UK, I guess, mm. even though he came from a poor family. Um, and he is brilliant. They saw that he, they thought he would be a good match. So, you know, I would say that they just weren't compatible. No. They did not get along. Mm. And for a lot of my childhood, I think I always... Like I was like a detective trying to figure out who was in the wrong, right? Mm. Who, which parent caused this marriage to fail, this mm. family to break up? Mm. Yeah. Um, and I would look at each of them suspiciously, like who's in the wrong? And as you get, and I would, you know, interrogate my grandparents on both sides. I'd be like, I'd ask them about my parents' childhood, mm. trying to figure them out. Um, and obviously, my, both my parents are amazing people. Neither of them were the villain or at fault. And you come to realize that they were just utterly incompatible and brought out the worst in each other. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the UK, in an environment where arranged marriages are not common now, mm -hmm. you just go on a few dates and realize, oh, like let's sack that off. Mm -hmm. That's not going to work out. And in their case, they got married and had a kid and you know, mm. the, the stakes were much higher. Well, that, that story does continue through your story and we will mm. we'll delve into that about how it impacted you. Um, summarize the first six years of your life because there's a lot of moving going around. You, yeah, moving. Living with the same people all the yeah, time. Yeah, no. It's really interesting. I think the first time that I lived with my mum full time was actually when I was 11. Um, wow. So the first 11 years of your life, you're not, Full time, Full, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I was, well, I actually, I lie. F I was born in Scotland and then for the first two years, but I don't remember any oh, of yeah, it. Yeah. I lived with both my parents. And, um, you know, I get told so many stories about my time in Scotland and I have so many photos. And sometimes I think I remember. But in truth, I think I'm just constructing these narratives and these like images in my head from the stories and the photos. Mm. And so then when I was about two, my dad decided he wanted to move back to India. He was missing home. And I think he wanted um, to do good for his people and he wanted to build a hospital. And so, you know, we went to live with my mum's parents in a city called Coimbatore. Um, and I went to school in India for two years. Mm. Yeah. And again, there, I think I have some memories from You're, that This time. is two till four, so it's still, yeah, it's yeah. still very I have days. some memories, but there are also a lot of stories and a lot of photos. But yeah, there are like 
flashes of memories. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I have to say, you know, when I was a teenager, I used to remember that time when my mum, because she was doing medical training, she was in the middle of her medical training, she stayed in the UK. So just me and my dad had um, gone to India. They weren't separated at that time, but they like definitely knew that it wasn't working. Mm. And I remember as a teenager, I used to think, God, I was so mean to my mom. I'm really sorry, mommy. I used to think, God, like what kind of mom would leave their child? Wow. And then something happened. I don't know, I think I must have been reading a book or watching a film, maybe listening to a podcast. And it clicked and I thought, I don't think my mom was consulted on whether to move back to India or not. I actually mm. think that there was a disregard for her career there. This oh, was something right. she was, I think it was actually when I started taking, that's what it was. I started taking my career seriously and mm. it became my priority. And I realized that I, I believe I'm a feminist and I read you know, feminist literature. And I realized that my judgment to my mum was so patriarchal, it was so misogynistic because essentially she had this career that she was super passionate about. She had spent 10 years working her ass off to get into this like prestigious medical training program. And my dad decided he wanted to go to India to do good for his people, right? Again, mm -hmm. here is the start of this idea of like- Very noble. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, two people who neither were in the wrong. It just wasn't compatible, it wasn't right. Um, and she was asked to leave all of her hard work and uproot her life again, just as she'd started making roots in the UK, to go back to India. And I realized that was not fair. And no man, no one would accuse a man of being a bad father or anything like that if he was in my mum's position. Mm. And so actually, you know, it was, it was when I started taking, when I started prioritizing my career, I apologized to my mum for making her feel bad, for accusing her of leaving me when she was disregarded. Mm. Yeah. She wasn't treated fairly by asking to abandon her career, something that she cared about. Um, and again, like I said, my dad wanted to do something good. Yeah. So you can understand his motivations and his like pursuit of this. Yeah. So speaking of careers, your 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 vision of your career kind of starts quite early, but before we start, I need to finish. Yeah, school, I need to finish, I... finish the summary of the moves you yeah. made over the world. So then I think, I think my dad wanted us to be, I think my dad like recognized the importance of, I guess I wanted to be close to my mom. It was as simple as that. And I think that after he'd been working in the UK for so many years, he realized that the transition back to India was really hard was difficult yeah. and things didn't work out. And so we moved back to the UK. But again, as a lot of doctors will know, you don't necessarily get to pick where your rotations and your training is, it can be in separate areas. So my father was moving around all over the place, um, training as a surgeon and my mum was doing the same as a medic. Um, and I um, was in Hoylake near Liverpool, in Liverpool. No, can't remember. From India um, to Liverpool. I know, change. it's mad. It's mad. Um, and I lived sometimes with my mum, sometimes with a nanny. I remember there was a period of time where um, my parents paid one of the teachers at my school to look after me wow, during the okay. weekdays. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember it wasn't, it really wasn't easy. I, I remember like my parents would buy me gifts and that teacher would like take them from me oh and well, yeah it was kind that's of, not nice that's i know not fair. memories and you're like six a younger well, younger five. i was like four and five okay. so sometimes i'd be living with my mom sometimes with nannies and you know so my grandma and my aunt came over took after me for a bit so it was very like unstable i would say yeah. not emotionally i remember feeling really loved and I had a lot of attention and I certainly had a lot of resources, mm. monetary resources thrown at me, but like just l literally geographically, yeah. um, it was unstable. And I certainly didn't know what it was like to kind of have that 
come home, a routine. I didn't mm-hmm. have a routine. Mm-hmm. Um, and then at six, I went to boarding school until 11. And I remember the boarding school at the time it was tiny. They would only take people 11, 10 and 11, age 10, 11 and above. And so I had to have an interview with the headmaster who was such a, he was such a kind, kind man um, to prove that I could handle it. Like I had to prove that my cognitive ability was that of someone around 10 and 11. Oh, you were six. Wow. six. So like I remember at the time my mom was teaching me the bones of the body. Wow. Um, you know, all of the bones, their names, their scientific names. And um not many six year olds get that kind of training. <laughs> no, no. It was a fun, it was like a fun game we play while cooking or cleaning, or whatever. The knee and I bones remember- connected to the thigh bone. Was it that one? No, no. so it was it was a little bit more Complex sophisticated. Not the thigh bone. Yeah, no. I'm still there. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember like I found excuses during that meeting with Headmaster to bring up like the patella. And, wow. you know, various other things. How do you crowbar patella into a conversation? <laughs> I think I would, I like hit my hand on my knee and I went, ow, my patella. Oh. And, you know, showing genius. off, like yeah. utterly, sh- shamelessly showing off. Get down to the poem at the end, I'll start with genius. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, um, so you got in. I got in. Wow. And so you're just amongst 10 year olds as a ten year- So I, so there was a big dorm of girls. But then because I was so much younger and my bedtime had to be earlier, I had a private room. But I have to say, I loved boarding school. I really did. And the headmaster's name is Mr. Hyam. I want to give him a shout out because him and his family and his daughter, they were so, so lovely. Um, And I had a lovely matron and all the older kids really doted on me. Like, I, I don't want anyone to think, I have to say boarding school was such a wonderful time. I was treated so, so well. I only have happy memories. And because I'm an only child, um, it felt like I had so many siblings. Mm. And and so we're on this this story, this journey of how this young girl achieves her dreams. And is this where your love of acting and drama begins? Yeah. At this boarding school? Yes, it was. Um, I mean, I think since birth, I've been a performer Mm -hmm. and like, I've always wanted to put on shows and I do accents. And my grandfather tells me this story of um, when I was a toddler, he'd say happy and I'd like make a happy face and he'd say sad and I'd start crying and like be scared. And, you know, so I think from birth, I was like that. And it's what I just always naturally wanted to do. Performing in general, dance, singing, all of it. But it was at boarding school where I guess I got training. I had classes I would enter competitions and you know win some of them um and in various categories and that's how my love of Shakespeare began when I was like eight and nine and do you start thinking this is a career at this point you're just enjoying absolutely not absolutely not it's like an impossibility no absolutely are you thinking about career at this point you're just having fun you're just a kid no 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 no. um I think I wanted to be like prime minister Six. Strong as- aspirations of six. Yeah, mad. So <laughs> stupid. God, I was such a like wanky kid. So obnoxious, <laughs> precocious, I guess. Um, I suppose I had to be. Um, but yeah, I. It's where I said I would. I think I, like formal training began. Mm. You you have a moment, I think, and this is quite interesting in terms of the Bridgerton story, which we'll get to. Um, in terms of race, in terms of ethnicity, and so different ethnicities together. And you yeah. have a moment when you were very young, I think eight years old, mm. which shifted how you saw yeah. the outside world and your place in it. Yeah. What was what happened? What was that moment? Yeah. So again, I have to say, not everyone that went to the school boarded. It was only a, you know a handful <laughs> of people, international students, mainly Spain, China, and Thailand. Um. And every, like, it was so loving. And I think I felt really safe there, actually. And, um, you know, I recognized that I looked different. It was like a very white area. But Sorry. Well, the area was white because the boarding school wasn't. There were Chinese students and Thai students. I recognized that I looked different. Mm-hmm. But I... I didn't understand what it meant, right? Like I didn't, un- I didn't understand the repercussions of having a different skin color, being of a different race and ethnicity. 
Um, and then that was just the boarding facilities. The majority of the school was white. In fact, every other person was white except one other Indian kid called Ayush. And God, the number of times Ayush and I, um, people thought we were, people asked if we were siblings. Right. Mm. Even when we had different surnames, like the yeah. number of times. And I, I mean, like you just have to not be stupid, I think. I don't know, I guess, I don't know. It's crazy. Um, and I have to say, before that, it's interesting. Before that, like when I was, you know, I remember in year two, we were changing for PE. This was before the kind of event when I was eight. I remember being called poo colored, but I, and I remember being again, embarrassed by it. But I think that, you know, like, at that young age, you just find poo as a funny word. Mm -hmm. So like you'd call people a smelly poo. Like you'd call mm -hmm. anybody of any color a smelly poo. Mm -hmm. And it wouldn't, it didn't feel problematic. Yeah. So I remember being called poo colored before, but I, I just thought, oh, it's like, you know, we say all these rude words when we're little. Mm -hmm. Like you'd kind of whisper in someone's ear, like damn or butthead and like run away, you know? <laughs> yeah. So I, I thought it was something like that. But then when I was eight, I remember I borrowed a top from this girl called Amy. I mean, no one's gonna know who she is. It's just the first name. Um, and I gave it back to her. And the thing is, I wasn't even in the room, but suddenly everyone like gasped. Oh, so I, yeah, I borrowed a top for PE. Um, I finished PE, I gave it back to her. Um, and obviously when you're like eight, you don't have showering facilities. And like, I was at boarding school, so I just gave it back to her. And like, you got changed and I was outside the changing room and I just hit everyone inside gasp. And I'm like, oh my God, what happened? And then obviously I didn't hear, but everyone came around me and said, are you okay, are you okay? And I was like, I don't understand. I don't understand what happened. And like some girls ran out and got the teacher and they were like, Amy called Sharitha, you know, she smelled the top and went, called her a stinky Indian. And again, it was just like a hot flush and I felt so embarrassed. Mainly because I wasn't even in the room when it happened, but everybody else was. So there was that level of embarrassment. There was an embarrassment that like I was being seen as a victim. There was, an embarrassment over like, did I smell? Was I smelling beyond like having played sport? Um, and I realized that she had used, I didn't understand what it was, but I'd realized that she had used my identity against me. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, she had diminished me. She had destroyed my existence with two words, right? And I always say like, that was when I became race conscious. Conscious. That's when I realized, oh, I'm different. I'm never gonna fit in. I'm not always gonna be seen as different. And as I get older, I see more and more situations. Like I'm in a lot of white middle-class situations where I think to myself, being privately educated my whole life, I've been to this kind of university. We've had very similar upbringings, been on similar holidays, yet you do not see me as the same. And I guess I was always gonna learn that lesson, was eight a young age, I don't know, did it have to be that harsh, I don't know. But I do remember after the event, the teachers, they made her apologize to me, and I remember them saying, oh, you know, but she, she's lost, she lost her mother, she's had a really tough childhood, so you have to forgive her. And I thought, do I? Do I have to forgive her? What is the pipeline from like a really tragic childhood event that has nothing to do with race, mm -hmm. to racism, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But it was interesting how all of these adults were so quick to like dismiss it mm -hmm. and brush it under the rug for me. Mm -hmm. I think this is quite interesting, this 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 story, because you, you were you know, in present day quite an advocate for mm -hmm. the, the issues with racism in the industry yeah. and you've been through that experience yourself. So it seems like this is where maybe that... Um, that passion for, for things to change maybe started as, yeah. as you, your experience of this at such an early age and, and again, seeing how the world was and the world you were in. I think 
I don't know if that's true. I actually think my sense of justice and wanting better for the world is actually from my father's upbringing oh, yeah. because I think I'm so aware of my luck and my like privilege that I have not earned. And I think it feels incredibly random and incredibly depressing that like we might have the best artists, the best actors, the greatest minds, the greatest scientists, the cure for cancer, the person that can convert the carbon dioxide that we generate into a useful material in India or in um, South Africa or Sudan or Thailand. And just because they don't have access to resources, they don't get to live that to their full potential mm. and the world doesn't get to benefit from their brilliance, right? Mm. Like. I think that is actually where I got my sense of justice. Absolutely. But I think specifically to do with race, yes, I would say that is the event that made me, I say race conscious, made me realize that I'm not gonna fit in. That's the thing. I think I realize I'm never gonna fit in. So it is a futile attempt to try. Mm. There is no nothing to be gained from trying to fit in and trying to assimilate. That doesn't mean that I didn't stop. Like, of, of course, in your teenage years, that's all you're trying to do. You're trying to assimilate. And of course, I went through the period of like rejecting my heritage. But I think even at eight, that was in the, it was where I the balls got rolling of like, oh, wow, you you see me as different. And that different is less than it's mm. not equal. It's it, it's beautiful to recognize differences. It's obviously awful to see someone's difference as an inferiority. Mm. Um, and then obviously it's only when I was older, maybe 15, 16, that I fully realized that I was never gonna fit in. And actually the things that make me different are the most beautiful things about me. Um, and they're my greatest strengths. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any lessons from the story so far? There's a few, there's a few taken here. I think the first one that strikes out to me is to, always appreciate where we start from you know because my myself as well my family came from Jamaica my mother's side and it wasn't easy and you know they worked really hard to get the family over one by one and mm. you know that meant that some of my aunties and uncles were left over with other family members while their mother and father were across the seas in the UK and eventually they got that got everyone over but also to think of what what can be done is there anything that can be done with children at a younger age to help them realize that differences are normal, right? Because I went to a village lower school and faced some similar, similar like prejudice situations where certain names started, I was called certain names and it spread like wildfire until I had to just stand up and, and fight my own corner because the teachers didn't do anything, you know? I think what's scary is how early it starts. So again, mm being called poo colored at like six mm. is really relevant. And I remember like, that was a memory I hadn't actually thought about because it didn't affect me. Like I wasn't ashamed or embarrassed by it. Cause again, I didn't deep it. I just thought that's just like children being silly. And do you know when I realized how awful it was and actually how racial it was, was when someone who's basically like my, like my goddaughter, she's half white, half black and her skin color is she's very light skinned, but her features, phenotypically, she is more like her father who is from Sierra Leone. So phenotypically she looks black, but her skin color is white, like white with a tan. Mm -hmm. And her mum, who is white, um, texted my mum or called my mum and said, you know, I'm a bit distressed. My daughter on the playground got called poo, poo today. Is that normal? Is that like, I don't know, it's not even, is that normal? That's, isn't that a crazy, even, crazy thing to even say? Mm. She was like, what do I do? Like, how do I handle this? Has that happened to Trithra? And my mom was like, yeah, 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 it happened. It's just like something kids go through. And when my mom told me this, and my mom really dismissed the concerns because it did happen to me. My mom was like, you know, it is what it is. And I thought, isn't that mad that we've just normalized this? Because I think my mum and I had always rationalized it as like, oh, it is a description. I'm poo colored, which is crazy to even think. That sounds so psychotic. Like that is not an accurate description for her. It is just racism to like an eight year old mm. on the playground. She's not that color. 
And I, no one is that color. But like, even so, I thought, oh my God, it, it wasn't just a silly thing to tease. It was actually just racism. And the fact that my mum and I dismissed it so easily just to, I guess, appease and survive is crazy. Mm. And I just, I just locked that up until it happened to someone that I love and I care about. And I went, oh, that mm. was a really like messed up thing to happen yeah. or to be told. And no, I'm sorry, being six or eight or whatever, it doesn't make it acceptable. Mm. No. And you have to be really careful what you're teaching your kids. And, um, and like teachers again, bless teachers and parents, they'll just go, but he's just a kid or she's just a kid. It doesn't matter. It does matter. Mm. But mm. teaching your kid to be an awful person. And you can't just brush it under the table and say, oh, you know, give them a hug. You have to teach them why that's wrong. And it doesn't, it, like, there's no right age to start learning about this stuff. Black and brown kids and, you know, East Asian kids, we have to learn about racism from, like, a very, very young age. And so do white kids. Mm. You can't protect them when they're not even the ones being hurt by it. Mm. Mm. It's not a, I'm sorry, you're, you're young. Oh, they're young, they don't know better. Well, teach them better. They should know better. This is a great moment to teach them. Mm. Where did they even learn it from? Mm. That's your role as an adult who knows better yeah. is to tell them. And I'm sorry, it is not up to the black and brown kids to forgive. It's not. It's for the parents and the teachers to teach the white kids better. Mm. I just, yeah. Yes, that's, that's really important because, yeah, then... You know, the playground can be a very hostile environment to a kid who's being picked on or who's facing name calling. It's generally, especially when they're young, because they're trying to make sense of why am I being called this? And as we've just said, no one's then kind of explaining to the other kids why they shouldn't say that, how it affects yeah. them. And, you know, everyone's born how they're born. No one gets to kind of spin a wheel or select how they're going to come into the world. So our differences are a natural way that we... Yeah. exist you know and i think what was crazy was like the ex just kiss and make up or mm. you know her mum died so she's like she's had a hard time so she can be racist and, yeah. effectively what and, saying. I, I, and i feel like from the dialogue that i got fed back it was you're you know that girl got told you're not allowed to say those things rather than that is morally wrong mm. and that's like a real difference it's about what is moral versus what is acceptable in polite society mm. yeah right someone saying you're not allowed to say that word is very different from that word is incredibly wrong and it's incredibly hurtful and it makes you a bad you do a bad bad thing when you say it yeah mm. those are very very different ways of tackling this mm. right and i think it's it's just yeah, it's important and you have to start young. Mm -hmm. And and it's not the last time in your life that, that comments are made about your ethnicity. We will get to that. Um, your 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 school life goes very, very well. You're very <laughs> academic. Um, your your family des described you as, as a, like a, a prodigy oh my child. God. Yeah, like, child ah! prodigy. <laughs> very intelligent, <laughs> like, is, let's just say that. Um, and you do work your way through school and you get into... This, you know, the, if you're an academic in the UK, there's two universities you want to go to, and you went and to And I one went of to the best one. Oh. The other one. We're not getting involved <laughs> in the Cambridge versus Oxford debate here. Um, yeah. But yes, you go to Oxford. Yeah. Um, you, you get first class honours degree, not in drama. Not in drama. They don't do drama at Oxford University. There you go. That's why then. Uh, what did you get first class honours in? Philosophy, politics, and economics. Mm. But you do do drama while you're there. Oh my god, yes. And is this when you start to think this could this is this could be my life? This is what I want to do for my career and life, or it's still just a hobby, fun thing to do at this point? No, I didn't think it could be a career, but I'd certainly think so. For context, when I was, I would say from like the age of eleven to fourteen, no, like nine to fourteen, I would. I was like a child actor for musical theatre, right? And I would do voiceover jobs. Is this National Youth Theatre? Uh, no, that was later. Okay. But I would, like, I, I was, you know, I performed Chitty Chitty Mang Mang and Jason Technical at Dreamcoat and, like, did voiceovers for various cartoons and stuff and books and all this. I And I loved it. But then as, you know, I got into GCSE years, my parents told me to hunk down and focus on academics and enough with allowing drama to kind of 
take up so much time and mm. allow you to miss school, etc. And so it really did take a backseat. And my main extracurricular became sports. I played a lot of netball and hockey growing up. Yeah. yeah. At a pretty high level as well. Um, which took up just as much time, actually. <laughs> so I don't know what the logic that was. But um, I would say at university is where I realized what it it is what I love to do. Mm-hmm. It's like what brings me the most joy. It is where I feel the most free. I don't, it is where I feel most enlightened, maybe. Mm. I don't really know the right description. I just feel the best, mm, at yeah. my best doing mm. it, right? Like in various different situations, I feel the best when I'm performing. But I never thought it would be a career because again, like I just, it was an impossibility, right? Mm. It wasn't that I thought I'd fail. I just thought it wasn't, I lacked the creativity to think I could do it because I didn't see that many people like me. Oxford drama was so, um, it was also quite elitist. Like all of these white kids from private schools, they like knew each other before we all ended up at Oxford, which you kind of look around and you go, how do you guys all know each other? (laughs) Yes, a lot of you went to the same school, but like you also went to different schools and you all know each other, how? Um, And you know, it was like very in crowd and it was the same people that did everything and cast their friends and everything. And much like, I guess a bit like the industry, so that's why it didn't seem so, it wasn't so immediate obviously it might be a viable career yeah. because it's just you still Absolutely. felt like yeah, a bit, a of, an bit of an outsider 100 percent. and um i'll credit this person i admire so much i went to oxford with her fran fran rivers and she um became the she is black and she became the president of the oxford university drama society and she actually is someone who inspired me to be more of an advocate within this space. Mm. And she was like, I'm gonna put on an all Bane production of a play. It's never happened in Oxford before. And it's happened on Cambridge with the actors, but not with the crew. Mm. So in Oxford, I'm gonna put on the all first all Bane production, crew and cast. It was Medea, I played Medea. And, and Fran, by the way, is a sensational actor and musician herself. She's killing it on screen and on stage. Shout out to Fran. Um, because she had a vision, she wanted to make Oxford drama more inclusionary and like, it was so inspirational. And we were in the same year. I'm talking about her as though she's like much older, but no, we're in the Mm. same year. Um, She had a vision, she said, I wanna make this space more inclusive. I wanna like involve my people. And she did it. She just forged ahead and did it. And it was such a, that was like my best experience at Oxford, being surrounded by this beautiful community that was so talented, that often overlooked, and we just got to create this art together. Um, so you so, kind of saw a vision of what how things could look how like. How things could look and how wonderful it was, what a special mm. experience it was, and like what kind of person you have to be in Fran to make it happen. Okay, mm. and what um, year was this, roughly? 2018. Okay, so 2018 is when you see clearly not thinking about maybe this is a career because you you go into the world of consulting. Yeah. You get an internship. Yeah. At no small place. At a Austin Consulting Group. There yeah. you go. Which, Shout out VCG. <laughs> which is a, a anyone who might not know who knows. Um, 12 billion dollars in revenue in 2022. This is part of the big three management consultancy firms yeah so you're like on this pretty good track right now let's say you uh, no doubt smashed your a levels and everything before that you get your first class honors at oxford so you're on this like path to to have a very good career maybe in consulting i mean it was you know what it was at oxford there are like it was consulting especially for mckinsey vcg bain is considered Mm -hmm. If you're an intelligent person who wants to work hard but doesn't want to do something as mindless and boring as banking, you go into consulting. It is like right. incredibly competitive to get into it. And so I think it was almost a competitive nature that and this it was the like the, it was the right thing to do. This is what people who, you know, are not motivated by money but they want to be in like this elite environment, that's what they do. And your parents were encouraging of this. I'm yeah, sure. and it's super Very prestigious happy. and all this. Yeah. And so I did it because that is what one does. One does PP Oxford, and then if you're good enough, 
you join McKinsey or BCG. Mm. And I loved, by the way, my internship, I loved it there. I still have friends um, at BCG. They've, a lot of them have now left to do other things. Um, I loved my internship. I was surrounded by brilliant people. I was mentally chal- like stimulated. I was challenged. Um, I was happy and I could imagine that like if I did stay there, probably would be burnt out and I would have aged a <laughs> hundred more years. But I think I could have been happy actually. Yeah. Yeah. Um and then you this is when the gap year comes along? Yeah, this is when the gap year comes along. So then, you know, the job offers in place and I was like, Yeah, I'm gonna join BCG. But I always had this niggling feeling. I still while I was happy at BCG, I I was aware, like I had the self awareness to know that I felt even better while doing something else. So I said to myself, you know what? I'll take a gap year after uni before I join BCG. I'll take a gap year and I'm going to do all of the acting there. I'm going to do mm-hmm. like get into local theater. I'm going to like do short films. I'm going to get it out of my system before I start this incredibly demanding job. And then, if, and I was doing that for a few months. And this is 2019 now. Yeah. So we all know what happened in 2020. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is crazy. So you're literally, it's just like get out your system and then yeah, I'm going to start my exactly. corporate career for the rest of my exactly. life. Exactly. Yeah, and which a lot 20, of people will be able to relate to who's still in corporate world right yeah. now. They maybe had a dream one day, but they yeah. they made the other decision. They carried on. They but, carried yeah. on going. It's the, the usual. Version. It's the usual ladder, right? Mm-hmm. Exactly. Mm-hmm. I always think of life like a lot of my life was like a train where I wasn't conscious of whether, like, at every stop at the station, I never really thought about whether I should stay on the train or get out. Right? Mm. Because the, at least being on the train, the train is moving. Whereas if you get off the platform, you're stagnant. And I thought, okay, just moving forward is key. And I never really contemplated whether it was my time to get off or not. And the stop was always do well at GCSEs, do well at A-levels, go to Oxford, go to this kind of elite corporate environment, make partner, you know, buy a house in a country, you know, all this. Get a dog, now, get like, a husband. Exactly, a now like, oh, it. shoot me in the head. But the time <laughs> it was like, this is the path, the train is moving forward. I didn't really like evaluate whether it was what my calling in life was. Mm, what powerful question. Yeah. yeah. And then COVID happened. Mm-hmm. And I think everyone was forced to take a beat. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I always say this, I think everyone became a little bit more introspective. We saw so many people quitting their jobs or moving careers, taking risks, whether professionally or personally, right? Ending relationships, committing to relationships, all of this stuff, moving in, moving out, you know. And I saw my parents going to work every day in hospitals, putting their, I mean, it feels dramatic, but accurately putting their lives on the line, Mm. helping people. And I thought, are they, did they immigrate to this country? Are they doing all of that for me to just survive? Mm. Surely, what is the point? If, If survival is all that we're aiming for, if they did all this to survive, surely they want more for me than to just survive. They want me to thrive. Mm -hmm. Like, otherwise, what's the point? I'm in survival mode. Am I going to tell my kids that all they have to do is survive? So surely someone has to reap the benefits of all of this hard work, all of this sacrifice. And I thought it should be me. (laughs) Yeah. Did you remember a specific moment? Are you lying in bed one morning, you wake up and you go, (gasps) and you have these thoughts? So I think while during COVID, I was working for this um, social policy institute where we were doing a lot of COVID reporting. And so every day, because I was stuck at home and it was a remote job and it was good data analysis, experience, whatever, you know. Um, And I was reporting on COVID death numbers every single day. And, you know, I, I really just thought, God, like, uh, you just stop taking life for granted, I guess. And what did I want out of life? I asked myself these questions. And I thought, you know, I have to, I have to. In a way, I think taking the leap to become a professional actor, it felt like taking ownership over my life, but it also actually really felt like honoring my parents and all of the hard work that they've done. Because isn't that, I don't think they necessarily see it that way, but surely they've worked hard and sacrificed so much so that I can be the happiest I can be and that I can fulfill my dreams. Otherwise, what is the point? We're all just surviving and we're all just like, someone has to benefit. 
And maybe it is selfish to think it's me, but I really do think that I'm honoring their hard work and their sacrifice by trying to live the happiest life I can live, by trying to thrive. And um, so then, yeah, I just you, decided to- What's fascinating is, had you not been staring at those numbers every day, would you have made that change in, in mindset? I have to say, I really struggled with the idea that something that is just objectively one of the most traumatic things that has happened in modern human history, something that has devastated countries, communities, families, was sort of the best thing that ever happened to me. Yeah. That's a really yeah. hard um, sort of thought to acknowledge and accept. Like, how can something so wonderful have happened when it caused so much pain and suffering for millions of people across the world? Well, it's, it's, it's a very, life. it's almost like you went and read a load of sort of stoic books and folk <laughs> and sort of thought about the mortality of life. Because that, well, I do have a philo well, I do have a philosophy degree. Yeah. Um, mm. I think this is the interesting thing. I think this is the moment people can really learn something from. Mm. And what, what do you think is the, the sort of lesson from this part? The road often traveled comes with a blueprint. As we said, it comes with the car, it comes with the house on the hill, it comes with the savings, it comes with the not seeing your children as much, it comes with not being able to explain that I did follow my dreams, it comes with a very boxed up perspective of life or a, a very boxed up experience of life. Not to say it's good, not to say it's bad, to say it is what it is. But if you can be in a position where your, your mind is still free enough to analyze what you are doing and for what purpose. It can allow a new path to develop where you think, you know what, I could do something else. Because mm. then as you said, you looked at, or else I'll be passing down the same things to my children, my next generations, and what else will they learn from that? Well, I think it's asking the question, what's the end goal? Mm. What is the end goal? And I think like, especially if you're a really ambitious person who wants a lot for yourself, you can always just like want the next thing. But you have to ask yourself, what is the end goal here? Is it to be happy? Mm. Is it to be safe? None of these things are right and wrong, by the way. It's, I think it is important for everybody with their life experiences, with the traumas and the joys that they experience, they have to figure out what the end goal is. So you decide your end goal or your next mission is to, to become an actress. This is what mm -hmm. you make decisions to do. And now yeah. this is an, another fascinating bit is that is then what you do. So you, you, the advice is, you know, think about what you want to do in your life and your purpose, what you're here to do and what the goal and is. And I knew it, but I knew it. I knew I was meant to perform, right? But I think the decision was to pursue it yeah. and to be brave enough to pursue it. I think. So what did you what did you do about it? Then that's what the next step, right? Because you had some interesting tactics here. I did. That I worked. Did. I did. Break and, it and, down. And agents and casting directors across the world are gonna hate me for um telling my story. Um you gotta work smart and hard. Mm -hmm. People say work smart, not hard. You gotta do both. Mm. Um and so what I did was I Googled how do you become an actor? I literally learned to go. How do you become a professional? So simple, but you have to do that. You've got to start there sometimes. Yeah. And so the first, the first thing step. was, mm -hmm. right, exactly. No question is a stupid question. Mm -hmm. And that's what Google's for. I love that. And then the first thing it said was get an agent or like go to open casting calls. Go, you know, there were various things. And I was like, okay, well, how do I find out where open, I Googled, how do I find open casting calls? And there are various websites that post open casting calls, various Instagram pages, um, et cetera. So I followed all of those and I like signed up for all these websites. And then I Googled, how do you get an agent? And it said, you know, drama school. I was like, well, I'm not in drama school. Mm. Um, it was like, invite them to showcases. I'm in the middle of a pandemic. Um, can't do that. Can't do that. And then it was like, you could try cold emailing, cold calling, but like some agents will hate it and it won't work. But you know, and uh, actually I think it was don't do this. Don't oh. call, don't email. And I was like, well, I don't have any other recourse, right? I can't like, do I don't... anything you In say In the middle do, of a pandemic, so. <laughs> yeah, I can't do anything else. Mm. So I was like, okay, let's do this. So then I Googled top 20 like agencies for actors in London. And I made a list of those agencies. And then I went to each of their websites and I got a feel for them. And 
again, this is where the work hard part comes in. I emailed every single one of those agencies, but I personalized every email and the- That's think, 20 agencies? The agencies. Yeah. The thing is every agency will have a general info email, mm. but that will just, that will immediately put into trash. Junk. Yeah. I realized that I needed to like reach a person, mm -hmm. not a general info or an assistant or receptionist, whatever. I, need to, I needed to reach an agent. And so I realized because I had been in corporate environments that most people's work emails is some like really unoriginal derivative of their name plus the company's email. Mm -hmm. yep. So like, you know, our Apple, I think, I remember someone at Apple telling me, it's not anymore guys, so don't try to email him. But Tim Cooks was literally tim.cook at iCloud.com. Yeah. And then he obviously yeah. became CEO and then like, it's now a scrambled complicated yeah. email address. The point is most people's emails are like that. 100%. So I would guess, I would guess people's agents' email addresses, first name dot last name or first name, last name, you know, first letter of first name, surname. So again, you're working smart and you're working hard. Mm. And you know when it's not right because you get the bounce back. the bounce back. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I would email lots of different agents at the agency based on what they had. So I would look at who's on their books. If they didn't have a brown girl of my age, I would email them. If they did, I knew mm. they wouldn't be into taking me. Anyway, and I would schedule these emails to be sent at 9.05 a.m. in the morning so that, you know, I would send schedule to be sent so that by the time they like open their computer in the morning, it would be the first email mm. they would see. Mm. I love that. It's like the cherry on top that makes such a difference. I it's mean, a small I don't know. detail, yeah. but it makes a difference for sure. Yeah, strategy you, matters, right? You send it on a Friday, your percentage chance of it working. Friday is not. at 4 exactly. <laughs> exactly. And so um, I uh, then, again, it is luck and privilege and my agent did like didn't have a client who looked like me and you know it's cynical but it's true and again why like a blm protest had happened that spring and summer and like every industry every company wanted more black and brown people on their books and more acting roles were like available for black and brown people and so like Every agent, I think, was like, oh, my God, we need more non-white talent. And um, right time, you know, as well, in many ways. And so I got signed and I'm, I'm still with the same team today. And I love I love them all so much. But how did it happen? Did they call you back and go, let's they do this? They literally called me like 24 hours. And I will say that is why my agent is so wonderful and so good at his job because he is on it. He called me 24 hours after I sent the email being like, yeah, we want to, we want you to just like send a tape in an audition for us to sign you. Um, is that okay? And I did that and I sent the tape and then you, I never. Have you ever done that before? Never. <laughs> and I, I just did it on my camera and like, I didn't even have a tripod. My mum held it, <laughs> which, oh my God, That's what brilliant. an angel, what an angel for doing that. Yeah. Um, she's actually kind of my good luck charm, but. Um, and how how long have you been doing this process at this point? How many? It happened quickly. I think I was emailing it, like within a month. Wow, that's amazing. Mm. Yeah, and you sent probably hundred emails. Hundreds, yeah, hundreds. hundreds. So you get signed. This is when's this? What month is this? August. August twenty twenty. Right. And then start auditioning. Self tapes begin, mm -hmm. and um, within a couple of months, I auditioned for a show called Alex Ryder, and I auditioned for a show called Bridgeton in the same week and I got callbacks for both uh, or I got asked to audition again for both and um what are you thinking at this point I've gone from well a Alex, few months think I'm going to be a consultant yeah. and now I'm auditioning well I didn't think I was going to get it it's so interesting like when I had nothing in terms of like an acting career it was when my mind was the most free mm. and like I didn't stress and I didn't care and I would just do the audition whatever you're probably just happy you're auditioning and you're exactly. actually pursuing this exactly. as a career and right? I and I also like I have to say I think even then I didn't have self-belief I was like I'm going for this but like I do have the fallback of going to BCG if it doesn't mm. work out yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Handy. so you know again like people are like it's so brave but there was very little risk involved for me um and then in the pro like in the process of Bridgeton 
they decided I wasn't right, I, you know, for the role that I initially auditioned for. And then I got Alex Ryder and Bridgeton hadn't even come out. Season one hadn't come out yet. I was auditioning for season two. And so I was like, cool, okay, well, I'm going to be a series regular on this other show, fine. And then Bridgeton does come out. It's a mammoth success. It's a beautiful show. And I'm like, oh, sad. But, you know, it wasn't meant to be. And then as I'm in the makeup chair for Alex Ryder, the day of filming, I get a call from my agent saying, well, they want to consider you for this other role. Would you be open to it? And after some thought and some conversations, I did. And even then, I, like, met with them, and I didn't hear anything for a month. And I thought, God, twice. Mm. Twice. Embarrassing for me. No, it's just the industry. Yeah. Um, and then I got a call. I was in the allotment with my mom making polytunnel, like tubing, like cutting PVC tubing. <laughs> I get a call from my agent being like, yeah, so you're going to be meeting with Netflix and Shondaland tomorrow. Uh, yeah. Oh, and you're the only one that, like, it's it's basically yours. Like, you're the only one considering it. Uh, being considered. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Um, cool. Uh, why did it take like what? What's what's been going on? Why didn't I hear for a month? Like mm. what? And he said, No, no, no. They wanted you a month ago, but because you were on Alex Ryder, like, and it was during COVID. Because they were going to have to be filming at the same, same time. time. Yeah, some overlap. Overlap mm. and during COVID, so it was like there was also safety of like mingling and you know, the travel, it wasn't even filming in the same cities. And initially Amazon said no, right? Um, which is fair enough, like that's totally normal. They said, no, you can't do Bridgerton because you're filming Alex yeah. Ryder. Um, and then because of my agents and the, and I, and I need to give a shout out to many people, but anyway, a lot of people worked really, really bloody hard to make it work in the most precarious of situations, in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and I have to give a shout out to Amazon and Netflix for working together, which is like a mad thing mm, to say, yeah. Yeah. to make it happen. But specifically, the producers on both shows. So Richard from Alex Ryder and Michelle from um, Bridgerton. Yeah. They could have said no at any point. They could have said, this is too much hassle. This is too much work. She's not worth it. We'll find one of the other Which thousands happens, of people who wanted this role. Which mm. happens every single day to yeah. hundreds of people in this industry. Yeah. And because of the kindness of many people, but specifically these two producers, mm. my life changed, my career changed. And I'm forever grateful. And they didn't have to do that. So many people don't. Yeah. Um, and I remember that. I remember. Like, it's something... Things happen in your life and you think to yourself, I need to behave like that with other people. Mm. I need to pay it forward to other people. This is how I need to proceed in my business dealings. Mm. Um, so like Richard and Michelle, like I'm so grateful for them. And my agent works so hard and the casting director, like Cole works so hard, so many people. Yeah. What's what's the lesson Ash from the, the actual getting the, the work that was put in to get these roles and make the dream a reality. Strategy, smart strategy. And I was, you know, a management consultant. Yeah. Consultancy is all about exactly. strategy. It's all about I strategy. actually just, do you know what? I consultantified the acting career, right? Yeah, yeah. I just created like a case study and solved it. So if you want to be an actor or an actress, Get into a consulting, <laughs> get into learn the strategies, first. Yeah. and then become one. God, yeah. Yeah. That's that's the key. Google can be your friend, Google. and now you've got ChatGPT that can give you a lot of the map yeah. as well. Maybe. So you're you're thrust into the world of fame now. Like you've gone from an unknown, you know, not a professional actress to on Netflix's most watched UK English speaking UK show. Um. What is that like? What happens? How do things yeah. change? What was that experience like? A lot of it felt very like iterative in that there was one exciting thing that happened and then another exciting thing built on top of it. So it never felt overwhelming. It was yeah. like, oh, this feels like a natural natural progression. Um, and oh, sometimes I feel like I'm too self-aware or too like pragmatic that sometimes I look back on my first experiences, like my first fashion show was to a Dior show and I was so calm, I was so chill. And 
I wish I was more excited. I think in like the attempt to keep myself grounded and not to get carried away and to be overwhelmed, I like, I didn't fully absorb the magic of some of these exciting experiences I had. Because then later on, as I like got more experience and accustomed to these things, you'd meet people whose first show it was mm. and how excited they were mm -hmm. and how much fun they were having. And I, I was like, oh man, I never allowed younger truth to have that. I was always so like focused and professional and restrained. And it's like, I never allowed myself to like get carried away mm. because we always think getting carried away is a bad thing and too much of anything is a bad thing. But I wish I'd been carried away a little bit more. Well, what's it like the first day? It, cause it came out on the 25th of um, March. March. What's yeah. it like the first, do you sit there and go, right, I'm gonna watch my series with no. my family? But or? it was brutal. So one of my classmates, and he's still a very good friend to this day, told me before, truth or don't go online. Truth or don't you dare go online. <laughs> Yeah. And why? I, all I did was go online oh. and it was awful. And why was he saying that to you? What was behind because it? Because the similar experience that I had in season two, he had in season one. Mm. And so then, oh, he's such a beautiful, beautiful person. And um, the day it came out, right? He was gonna be the, he's, he was the biggest star in the world at that point. The day it came out, the 25th of March, or maybe it was the day after, mm. he said, meet me at Marble Arch. Or like, yeah, it was like Hyde Park or something. It was like, we're going for a walk. And we went for a walk, we went for a coffee, um, and he talked me through it for hours. As saying he was what? becoming like the most famous person in the world. Saying yeah. what? What was he saying? Telling me his experience, how to handle it, what to do. Again, um, this is, I think most viewers, most listeners can guess, it's Johnny Bailey. Um, he, again, you know, you, you meet people or you have experiences that really teach you how to carry yourself forward. He taught me what it was to be a leader. He was a leader on that set and he was a guardian of all of the younger actors mm. through the process and after. And he continues to this day to be that for all of us. Wow. And again, I banked that and I went, that is how I need to be. And then when I was a lead in my first film and there were a lot of actors where it was their first film, I don't think I did as good a job as him, but I really tried. I really tried to be a guardian and a leader like he was for me. And, but what is the advice? What was he saying you should do? Like, I don't think, look at the comments, I don't think respond. It was, I think it was, don't be myopic. That was his main mm, thing. Yeah. It was this short term chatter, chatter, chatter is not what's important. And he said, you're, he said, you want to be in this for decades. Mm -hmm. You want a rich and varied career. And he also said, you don't want to be, you don't want to be a well-liked celebrity. You do. And he said, it's not even like he was telling me what to do. He said, truth where I know you. You don't care yeah. about being a popular celebrity. You don't care about fame. You want to be an excellent actor who has an interesting and thoughtful career that lasts for decades. Mm -hmm. You want to be in this industry for a long time. So don't think about now, think about the long term. Don't think about the short term. Ignore everything that's happening now because it's not about that. And what was happening for you on social media? Obviously, were you getting lots of followers every day? Was that yeah, happening? What was that, that like? that was that. But again, I didn't let myself get carried away what, from it. What kind of growth was happening? You went from how many like to how 100, many? 100,000, like every two days. Really? <laughs> Whoa. Oh, so the moment the day it came out, is it? Yeah, is like it maybe like maybe a hundred thousand every few days. Yeah, but it was mad. And again, I didn't have any before that, but um, it was crazy. And um, and are you getting comments? Pos ninety ninety percent lovely. Yeah. The perfectionist in me doesn't care about the lovely ones, which is did you horrible let yourself draw because the lovely in? people are lovely, mm. and we should be giving our attention to them. Did you respond to any of the ten percent? Did you? Before the show came out, yeah. What would you? What was the scenario? I would just try to justify, you know, like, hey guys, I think you know this is why this happened and all this and. But what were people saying? Just you know, the thing is, you realize that passion is a beautiful thing, and to be invested in something a lot is a wonderful. But people who are. People who value something fictional over something real 
is because they're trying to escape their reality, right? Mm. When you prioritize the fictional over the real, fictional meaning this like pretend universe in this show um, and the characters on the show over the real people, it's because you have spent your life like avoiding reality because it might be unpleasant, it might be unfair, it might be difficult. And I think that fairly quickly, like a few months, I realized that people who are obsessively online or who are mean online, they're, they're clearly struggling with something and you get to a place where you go, do you know what? If being mean to me or if thinking awful things about me makes your day better or more bearable, helps you escape from the difficulties of your life, go ahead. Mm. And I, I just like, if, if that actually helps you get through your life, because they're clearly struggling, like if that helps you get through your day to think that I'm an awful person or think X, Y, Z or to send me hate, like, you know what, fine. Mm. That's, mm. yeah, okay. I'm, I'm happy to do that. And again, I haven't got any hate compared to like way more famous people who you know genuinely get like a lot of hate. But you tend to focus on the bad. Yeah, that's quite an ex- that's quite an experience and a perspective to to garner from such a kind of negative stimulus, let's say. Mm. But it's a very interesting one to ponder on. So I think Bridgerton's story in itself, we could do a whole podcast on because mm. it's it's uh, there's a whole story to it. I'd, I'd be interested to hear what. You, um, love you to share. Do you know the, back, the the in terms of the backstory of it, starting with Shonda Rhimes and how it c- mm. formed and the uh, the thinking behind the casting and why and anything you can share on on that. Absolutely. So, and so I think, what period? What year? So, um, obviously in the books, the books are set in the eighteen hundreds in the Regency era, and so like all the main characters are white, and you know I think. Um, and they're just, described as white in the book, as white blue as white. eyes, yeah, blonde exactly. hair, etc. Um, and I think like if you see Shonda's roster of other shows and projects she's been on, like diversity has been one of the things that she sort of advocates for. And so she wanted to create this world along with the showrunner for season one and two, Chris Van Dusen, this kind of racially diverse world, this fantasy, this universe. Um, and we should say that, just to describe a bit about who Shonda Rhimes is for anybody who doesn't know. She's a television producer and showrunner, writer. writer. She started her production company and she did a deal with um, with Netflix. Um, a big deal. Uh, her net worth is 250 million. She's one of the, the richest people in, in um, the entertainment industry. Everything she touches industry. starts to gold. I mean, she knows what she's doing. Phenomenal right? person. Mm. Um, and like, She's a hit maker. Like she deserves. Grey's Anatomy. She's behind. Scandal. How to get away with murder. Mm-hmm. You know, Bridgerton and Queen Charlotte are the newest editions, obviously. And, and Bridgerton was the first of this Netflix deal that she put yes, together, right? Yes, yeah. I believe so. I yeah. might be wrong, but I believe That's so. Right. But um, you know, and actually, the reason that Kate and Edwina and the Sharma family became a reality was actually because Chris. Which is the, that's the family you're in in the show, yes. Sharma, and you are Edwina in yes. the show. Um, Chris made it a priority to diversify his writer's room. Mm. And he hired an Indian writer called Geetika Lazadi, who is a dear friend and a phenomenal writer. And Geetika pitched to Chris, let's make, would you consider this? And Chris is a phenomenal, like, you know, he showed for season one and two, and Chris Van Dusen was a showrunner for season one and two at Bridgeton. What's a showrunner for anybody? Showrunner know? basically like is runs, runs things. The they yeah. run the show. They're like yeah. So so basically, he's who's who's speaking with. He's the boss. Yeah, yeah. he's the boss yeah. for the the show basically. Mm-hmm. Um, he he backed Geetika's vision. And, you know, the Sharma family was born. And I read that he was inspired by the historical debate over the 1940s African ancestry claims of Queen Charlotte. Right. Which is fascinating. Um, which is, and, and he wanted to base the show, obviously speaking with everybody else, on this alternative history in which Queen Charlotte was of mixed race heritage. Um, and See, I... I really like I appreciate that that's where it came from for him but for me it's for me 
I don't think it's necessary to get into the debate about history. There isn't much evidence that Queen Charlotte was black and I don't think it matters, right? Or mixed race, it doesn't matter. To me, we live in a world where like the most successful franchises are Star Wars, Harry Potter, the Marvel universe. This is a beautiful world. Bridgerton is a beautiful fantasy. Like, I just don't, I don't understand why we even have to go into his, the historical accuracy. It's not historically accurate. Otherwise, everyone would have no teeth and gout. <laughs> gout. Right? Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm sorry, but do you really think men look like Colin Firth? No. They were disgusting. Do you think women were hairless? No. They were hairy and damp and smelly and did not have like inch of makeup on them. What? And so it's just, it's frustrating. I just don't think that like you need his, you need to even bring in the debate about history to make it, make this show credible. It's credible because it is beautiful and it is real and the writing is genuine. And for me, it is a fantasy. It's fictional. I think that that's personally what I find interesting is that that's where some of the ideas came from is this picturing this alternative, mm. um, you know, historical account and what and, and when he said what he said was what might have happened if um if uh her mixed race heritage, if it was that, was not only well established but was transformable for black yeah. people and people of colour. Yeah. And in sort of like you could view Bridgerton as this look on this alternative history of this what might have been if she if she acted in, in a different way or certain ways. And uh, and Gold and Golda, who plays Queen Charlotte and a dear friend, she says, and I love how she says this. She says, Bridgerton shows how beautiful the world could be. Mm, that's mm. it. Yeah. Right from like a race perspective, she says, how exciting to imagine a world that is like this mm. with a black queen. Isn't that beautiful? Mm. With black and brown. Well, I actually don't believe in like a feudal system, but in this idea of like of, of black and brown people of being of such high status. Mm. Yeah, it's kind of like it's, it's like it's beautiful. How beautiful to imagine this world yeah. that it could be a possibility. Yeah. And I think that is it. The arts is about the imagination and what could be. Um, and that's what the show is for me. I just don't think it, it has to be about history. No, it's just that pressure isn't like ever imposed on other things yeah that's it if you said to someone imagine how london is now which is so multicultural so diverse mm -hmm. and everybody's living together but in the 1800s imagine what that would look like go and watch Bridgerton. that's kind of what it might be like mm. um which is interesting mm. um so you're you're flying high mm. this we get into 2023 now mm. You've made it. You've made this transition from the world of yeah. cons consulting path. Yeah. You're now a professional actress. There's no doubt about it. You're out there. <laughs> you're on red carpets. Mm. You're invited to fashion shows. You're in fashion magazines. You've got hundreds of thousands of Instagram followers. Mm. You must just be feeling great. Like, world is brilliant. Life's great. Yeah, surely there's going to be much, much more of it yes. in the next year. Um, Yeah, I think I did think that. I think I thought... I think I thought... Firstly, like, oh my God, what an amazing platform. It's just going to go up and up. Partly because my path into the industry was fairly easy, right? Yeah. And within a few months, I booked these two great opportunities. So I just presumed, oh, like, the industry is always going to be like that, right? <laughs> so naive. What is isn't. And I think I also compared myself to my co-stars on the show. The people that came before me, the people that were on it with me. And um, both those things were just very naive things to do for many reasons. Um. And I think it was really, really hard. I felt like, honestly, I felt like such a failure. That was what was mad. You felt I like a failure. Most, I'm, I was the most successful I'd ever been, recognizable I'd ever been. And yet, I felt like a complete failure. Because Why? Because I wasn't, to the extent that I thought was possible or I saw other people doing, I wasn't able to convert this wonderful platform I had been given into like, something even bigger, right? I mean, it's hard achievement. It's what's bigger than Bridgerton, very few things, but... Um, but where's I this coming like from? complete failure. How bizarre is that? Isn't that crazy? Like, if you told yourself that in 2019 that you're going to have this, this, and this, yeah. and, and you would feel like a failure, you'd be like, no, I'm exactly. going to feel great. And that is where the... That is also where, you know, 
recognizing what the end goal is really is important. Otherwise you mm. might just be in a constant state of misery and chasing. And that is like the lesson that I am learning. That is my journey right now is like learning, figuring out what the end goal is still. Yeah. And otherwise you're just yearning for more and more and more. It's like, like you said, the I think it's from the movie Cool Runnings where the coach says, if you're not happy with one gold medal, you're not gonna be happy with 100 yeah. or something like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. And I think about that, it's like, and I, but I really felt it, I felt like a failure because I wasn't, you know, I wasn't getting calls from <laughs> Steven Spielberg and like, <laughs> I wasn't picking Marvel roles and all this. I felt like a complete flop. I was, I felt like an embarrassment. Wow. And were you getting rejection at the same time? Of as course well I was as... getting rejections because I was going for more higher profile things. Mm -hmm. Like I was competing against people that I wasn't competing against before for much more high profile things. So yes, I was fate I was getting rejected, but it took me a long time to understand that, mm -hmm. that it wasn't the same. I was in a completely different pool in a completely different part of the process, right? Yeah. Um, and I think my agents really, like, they tried so hard to make me understand. And they also didn't understand where, they, where I was coming from. They're like, Truthra, how can you think these things? How can you think that you're a failure and you're doing awfully? And like, I genuinely used to think, oh, everybody's laughing at me. And they'd be like, who's everybody? And I go, like, the industry. The industry's laughing at me. Laughing at you about what? Like... But I, I, was a I was failing. I hadn't wow. converted this bridge to an opportunity into something bigger and better and you know, more successful. And the reality is probably everyone's maybe going through a similar everyone's thing with you. Like, certainly. what's the next thing? Sure. Am I going to make it? I'm sure. Does anybody care about me anymore? I'm All sure. of that. I'm sure. And how, how do you deal with that, those thoughts? Um, I think it's a practice of gratitude. Okay. I, well, um, let's, let's get onto this because right. this is some life advice, some, something you do to, to improve yourself, mm -hmm. let's say, um, of your morning routine. Yeah talk to us about it so people can yeah. learn some good tips about a morning routine yeah. and how you do it um so i think i was so go 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 and i felt like i had to be productive all the time and like my, i had to do you know always had to be career focused and like working 24 7 and i realized that like it wasn't productive i my output wasn't good and i was just unhappy and burnt out and all of this and so i think i figured out that i needed a more sustainable life routine and actually taking like 45 minutes out of your day in the morning and 45 minutes out of your day in the evening, a privilege, especially like if you're a parent, I know, can actually save you so much time during the day and make the time that you are working far more productive. So you used to just get up and feel like the race has begun and exactly. just get going? Exactly that. It was like, yeah. how much pro productivity yeah, can exactly. I get out of this day? Which like, I, I suspect is probably like an Oxford thing as well. But now what I do is... I fill out a journal in the evening of my morning routine, which consists of making my bed, skincare routine, showering, brushing my teeth, all of that, um, working out. And then I will make like a luxurious amount of time, like five to 10 minutes making a hot drink for myself. Whether that's like a lovely coffee or a matcha latte or a chai latte, like I will take my time. And then I will sit and I will read the news because it is important to know what is happening in the world um, and like, I know this is an awful thing to say, but like, it also makes me feel really bloody grateful because billions of people have it infinite, like so much tougher than I have it. So that's interesting. Cause that's kind of like your 2020 experience. You were like faced up with the mm. reality of other people and that inspired mm. you to change your life. And kind of, again, mindset changes, right? It's puts things into perspective. Um, I think you become a more interesting person when you like know about the world around you but i think it also makes you a more thoughtful and grateful person when you recognize what other people have at stake and i think to myself truthfully really you're going to be down because you didn't get like the role that you wanted or this brand didn't offer you a contract when there are people being killed there are people without housing there are people that like have be it like their water sources are being poisoned really and it's so interesting because I think in our society we've become super indulgent of some people and we're like every problem is relative yes of course every problem is relative but also low-key not <laughs> right my problem that my career isn't going the way that I thought it would is not 
is just not the same problem as the people that have to pick between heating their homes and feeding their children, right? Like that's just, it's just mm -hmm. not it. Mm -hmm. Even in relative terms, my problems aren't that deep. And I think it is important to be kind to oneself for sure, but also going, come on mate, snap out of it. Like your life is good. And what was this thing about going on Etsy and finding oh, yes. your... Yes. Yes, okay, so I have it on my phone, but I do it on my iPad so it's easier to write. Um, let me show you guys. This isn't the exact planner because I'm going to be honest with you guys, I forgot mine, but it's similar. So you can go on Etsy and buy it for like three to five pounds, yeah. and mm -hmm. it's a planner where mine's, this is a little bit different, but um, ooh, you can basically just fill out your morning routine, your to-do tasks, your priorities, but my favorite section is today I'm grateful for and in that section you really can contemplate you can do it for the day before on the day in the evening whenever you can really contemplate what was good about that day and it could be something sweet like I had a, I made a really good cup of coffee or I had a really good conversation with my housemate or I like had a really yummy sandwich the weather was great or it could be like I'm really grateful for my friends. I'm really grateful that I have financial stability. It can be anything. It's just what do you what has put a smile on your face? What do you, what fills your heart? What makes you warm? Um, and I think practicing gratitude has been so good for my mental health. It has made me much less of an <laughs> because you're like less narcissistic, right? Like you're less mm -hmm. self obsessed, and you go right. Like th there are much bigger problems out there. And actually, not only do I have to stop like the woe is me mentality, but also I actually have to commit far more of my energy in trying to rectify some of these injustices in the world. Like I think it's double focus. It can both like stop you from like reaching crisis of, oh, everything's awful, but also it can really be motivating and fill you with purpose. Mm. Brilliant, love that, great yeah. advice. And again, just you probably Googled planner for my life or something. I actually watched a TikTok video. Oh. where a, a girl was talking about how she organizes herself. She influenced me, guys. There you go. Yeah. Um, there is some good stuff out there. Um, yeah. Talk to us about what is next. So opportunity did yeah. come in. You're not a failure. Yeah. You've got great things coming yeah, up. Yeah, I do. Tell us about them. What's happening? I, um, I have a film coming out this spring. How um, to date Billy Walsh? Yeah, so there it was go. supposed to come out, but then a very important and needed strike happened. Uh, in um, my industry yeah. and so it was delayed postponed so it's going to come out this spring the final date is TBD on Amazon, Amazon Prime. Prime Amazon Prime okay. mm -hmm. um, which again it, it felt like a reunion because obviously Amazon Prime gave me my first professional mm -hmm. opportunity and then to give me my first film opportunity and to be a lead in that um, it yeah it just was a full circle moment what's the what's the synopsis story about synopsis, to it's, get it's just in, like intrigued. such a it's 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 a rom-com about these like three children t young adult adults um you know 18 years old um just about to leave school and it's it's so earnest i feel like a lot of rom-coms these days are cynical like there has to be like a oh you know we we inside joke like we get that it's a rom-com, we get that it's silly kind of mentality. Whereas like the rom-coms that I love, like When Harry Met Sally, You've Got Mail, they're so earnest. Um, and a lot of the films like that I love that our film, How to Date Billy Walsh, is inspired by like Ferris Bueller's Day Off. It's so earnest and it's so fun. And like, it's a family film. Adults will enjoy it, kids will enjoy it. And I think that's what How to Date Billy Walsh is. It's not serious. It's not especially thought provoking. It is just a really lovely, fun time. Cool. And you're you're kind of living out your dream of your gap year in where you're like, I want to do everything. I want to do it because yeah. you've done TV, you've done film, and, and now... now, oh my god, I think this is maybe the most exciting thing to happen in my career so far. Um, and it came to me from a team of women. And that also is actually something 
well, let me tell, say uh, what the thing is, and then I'll say what my it's resolution is. Hang on, right now, I feel like yeah. I'm in a jumble. It uh, is. So wait, so I'm going to be making my West End debut Whoa. in Ooh. a one-woman show nice. called Instructions for a Teenage Armageddon. Um, it's a six-week run starting on the 17th of March at the Garrick Theatre. So fairly know where we're filming. Oh, uh, that's pretty Ooh. cool. And it's an all-female team um, and young women as well. Um, and what's it about? What's the... It's Cook. it's it is essentially about this young woman that tells you what's happened in her life from the age of thirteen to eighteen oh. after a tragic event happens and how that has affected her life. And why I love this was that the voice of the character is just so real. It is exactly how teenagers speak. It is I find like a lot of teenagers in plays, films, they're so they have so much hindsight. And like famously, hindsight requires time, mm. right? They're so self-aware and thoughtful. And it's like, no, 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 no. Character that I play in the show, um, she's a teenager and you can tell. And where can people yeah. get tickets? That's what I want to know. I've searched Garrick Theatre. Do you just go to Garrick Theatre's website? You can website? go to Garrick Theatre or type into Google tickets for instructions for a teenage Armageddon. Mm. Yeah. Um, go onto my Instagram and plug my Instagram no go onto my Instagram and the link will be there in, on my page okay you Excellent. can get your link to your Instagram in the show notes so just scroll down wherever yeah, you're scroll watching down. honestly please come guys because who, um, can I can I ask actually who would want to come and see this like who's it for I yeah. I really think that it is like well, teenagers and parents because I think especially for parents it's really really important to know how teenagers feel how they express themselves it's so not straightforward as we all know we've all been through it um and i think for parents it's really important and for teenagers i hope that it makes them feel less lonely in the emotions that they experience i mean rosie day the writer she's so talented she's so brilliant and oh i'm nervous i just hope i do her words justice it's gonna be amazing i am yeah. sure and definitely will be there thank you yeah come watch Oh, and I have to tell you what one of my resolutions was, was that um, a friend of mine, he like introduced this really new system, a brilliant system into creating resolutions. They're not resolutions, they're intentions. And mm -hmm. I think resolutions can be like, previously were like, go to gym, drink more water. And I'm saying <laughs> that's not, it's not good. And it's also not specific. Mm -hmm. And so he introduced this framework um, and he was introduced by one of his friends, which is to split up your New Year's intentions into categories. So there's an emotional intention, a spiritual intention, an occupational intention, a social, social intention, and a personal intention. And one of my professional occupational intentions was, um, I want to work with more members of my community, whether that be Asian people or women. And so for this play to be a predominant, like, or female producer, female writer, female director, mm -hmm. predominantly female crew is like, it's amazing. And that I want that to be something that I channel and continue forward in every aspect of my career, whether that's producing, when it comes to the fashion, like I want to be supporting my communities and I want to be working with my communities. And it does kind of circle back to my experience at Oxford and mm. being in Medea and being with that BAME production so yeah. love that everything that, comes full circle yeah it just shows the butterfly effect of when one person decides to really put themselves out there to do something different to make some change mm. like the impact it had on you and now what you want to go and do it's with really that good. and the impact that will have on other people and then what they want to do it just shows you like the power of doing positive things to make positive mm. change you just don't know how far it can have in its effect um so very exciting to hear Okay, that is the story of how you became actress, uh, Edwina, and yeah. many other successful um, <laughs> ventures that you'll no doubt go on in your, in your life. Um, we're going to have a poem that Ash has been writing oh while God. the episode goes on. One summary I think that people can gain from your, your story and uh, lessons really is, and it's, it's come up in other episodes, um, as well as making your bed first thing in the morning, which CEO of Saatchi and Saatchi swears by and recommended. Um, but this whole notion of if you want something to change in your life, 
you have to make that first step you have to make the first change and it can be the smallest thing and it probably is a good idea to make it a really small thing mm. that if if you want to have this new life turn things around do your dream job start your dream business the first goal can be google it you know google something and it's so simple. That could be all you do that day, but it well, starts something. I, and the consultant in me would like to like give people a little bit more of a framework as to how to do that. And it's how I approach most of the things in my life is it's called backwards planning. Mm. So this abstract notion of like how to be an actor is so overwhelming. Like how does one be an actor, right? And so you think, okay, that's my end goal. I am here right which is i still want to work on my craft i don't have representation whatever write down where you are now and what your end goal is and work backwards mm -hmm. work from your what your ultimate destination is and like what are the milestones mm -hmm. that you will need to hit or the hurdles you will need to overcome to get there until you reach where you are at the moment and then once you've laid out that path you forget about it and you just focus on each individual hurdle Love that. And that's true for revision too, guys. If you're revising for an exam, figure out, you know, the date of the exam, how much time you have, how much hours you can commit, what is the most necessary things you have to do, and backwards plan what you'll have to get done. So in every aspect of life, like, it makes tasks more manageable, especially when they feel so, like, amorphous, like, an abstract, right? It's um, backwards planning. There you go. Mm -hmm. There it is. Great advice. Thank yeah. you for sharing. Great strategy. And thank you for a very insightful few hours. There's been a lot a lot shared in this. <laughs> uh, great perspectives. Whether that dream thought you have is a trickle or a steady flowing stream, despite any seeming obstacles, don't ever doubt your dreams. Looking at what can be done to educate those whose words can cause those different to become defenseless victims, but remembering to appreciate that your uniqueness means you don't ever have to try and fit in. Working hard and working smart, two keys for shaping your future. Seeing the gift of paying it forward, led from the extra mile taken by two kind producers. What a journey, what keen perspectives, seeing how life can really unfold. So whether life has you up or has you down, it's important to always identify that end goal. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you for wow, joining very us today. <laughs> there you go. And that is uh, your nice. story. Thank you for joining us. Hope I didn't waffle too much. No, it was great. It was great. <laughs>